So what if you have a patient who needs an urgent electrical cardioversion and you need to give them a little bit of pain control before you shock them? Or say you need to place a central line in somebody, but they keep moving around too much. What would be something appropriate to give them just to get them comfortable for the procedure? This is something I was thinking about yesterday on my cardiology long call because I remember in the past, we've had to place pads on people and get prepared to shock them. And beforehand, you know, in order to make them comfortable, you do want to give them some kind of medication before you shock them. Otherwise, it's going to be a very painful and unpleasant experience. And to be honest, I didn't really have a good idea of what the ideal medications are in order to prep them for the electrical cardio version. So let's talk about it. So there's a couple scenarios, I think, as internists that we're really going to be dealing with. Um, so the first one I'm kind of talking about right now is electrical cardio version, placing lines or doing minor procedures. And then briefly, I just wanted to talk about intubation. Uh, while I'm not going to really be doing this since I'm not going to be a palm crit fellow, um, you know, there is some different medications that they use for planned intubations versus rapid sequence intubation like on the floor. And I just wanted to kind of briefly go over some of the medications that they would use in those situations. So first of all, a discussion of procedural sedation. It's first to preface that obviously there are some risks to doing procedural sedation, especially in patients with relative contraindications. So our elderly or older patients, anybody with ASA 3 class, or higher, which is basically severe systemic disease, any significant medical comorbidities, especially COPD and heart failure, or signs of a difficult airway in case things start to go wrong. Those are definitely all uh, relative contraindications. But in general, I think for procedural sedation, when you're using low doses that we would be using, uh, it should in most cases be pretty safe. It is important to definitely have some safety equipment near the bedside just in case things do get worse. For example, um, a bag for them to throw up in if they need to, some pacer pads, reversal agents like naloxone, and flumazenil and a bag valve mask and stuff like that. So what are some of our agents that we can use? So propofol is definitely a very common one that we might be using. And uh, this one has a very fast onset of action and lasts about six minutes. Loading dose is going to be 0.5 to 1 milligrams per kilogram. IV with additional boluses as needed. And then the big risks here are going to be respiratory depression and hypotension. The next one we're going to talk about is Atomidate. And this is one that you may remember from medical school in that it's one of the induction agents that don't really cause much hemodynamic um, changes. The problem is once you become a resident uh, in internal medicine, this is not something that you're regularly ordering. And so it feels uncomfortable to be ordering something like this. But if somebody needs something for a cardioversion or something, it is good to have medications and know a little bit about them just in case. So the dosing for this is generally going to be 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. And then you can give additional boluses as needed. A lot of times you do like an additional four milligram boluses as needed. It has prolonged effects in renal and hepatic dysfunction. And then a couple things to note for side effects of this is going to be uh, myoclonus. So it can kind of cause some kind of twitching or fasciculations in patients. Uh, and that can sometimes make uh, certain procedures a little bit more difficult. And then uh, it has a dose dependent adrenal suppression, which you may remember from medical school. Moving on, we've got a benzodiazepine, uh, midazolam or Versed, very, very useful agent. Onset is within two to five minutes and it lasts about 30 to 60 minutes. And our typical dosing of this is going to be 0.02 to 0.03 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, in general, this really means 0.5 to 2 milligram doses. And the primary side effect here is going to be respiratory depression. Next, we're going to have fentanyl. And fentanyl is 75 to 125 times more potent than morphine. And the reason that people really like it is it's kind of fast on and fast off. So it's really good for elderly patients too, because you're not really sure if they're going to tolerate opioids. But if you give this to them, it's going to wear off pretty quickly. So the onset of action is basically immediate within less than one to two minutes. And it tends to last about 30 to 60 minutes as well, just like midazolam. You can do this with a weight based dose of 0.5 to 1 microgram per kilogram. Uh, but many times we just kind of default to a a default dose of 50 micrograms. And then in trauma patients or very severe pain, you can do 100 micrograms. Again, the side effect here is going to be respiratory depression. And the benefit here is that it really doesn't have that much effect on your blood pressure. Uh, which is kind of an uh, uh, ideal thing compared to something like propofol, for example. And then just a brief note on some other ones. Uh, so ketamine is definitely gaining a lot of uh, popularity recently because it doesn't cause as much respiratory depression. Patients are basically awake. They just have this analgesia, amnesia, and this like dissociative sedation, uh, which can be very helpful because it doesn't really affect their hemodynamics that much or respiratory uh, status. And then you can also uh, use things like barbiturates, and dexmedetomidine or Presidex, uh, all different options that can be used as well. But for the purpose of this video, uh, going back to electrical cardioversion, so say you're going to put some pads on somebody and do an urgent 
electrocardio version, what is something that you can give them beforehand to make the process as minimally painful as possible? In here, what I've really found is that the favorite medications that you're going to use are going to be Atomidate and Fentanyl. For Atomidate, you can do the weight-based dose of 0.1 milligrams per kilogram uh, and then give additional uh, doses as necessary. And then Fentanyl, you can give a small 50 microgram dose as well. And this is, in general, going to be really uh, an ideal combination to give patients who are going to get shocked. Uh, it's really quick on and quick off, and they're going to wake up basically minutes after their procedure is done. And Atomidate and Fentanyl have been studied in comparison to Propofol and Fentanyl, and it's found that Atomidate and Fentanyl had a faster onset of sedation. And then after the procedure, patients also woke up more quickly as well. And so it was found to be a su superior combination compared to propofol and fentanyl. In addition, you also have the benefits of more hemodynamic stability, which is really beneficial because a lot of times when you're urgently cardioverting somebody, they're kind of borderline in terms of their blood pressure or hemodynamic. Uh, and then today when I was talking with my cardiology attending, they also mentioned that when they're doing a planned cardioversion, a lot of times they'll give Versed one milligram uh, just to kind of prevent some of the fasciculations and myoclonus that you're going to get with Atomidate. So that's also an option that you can give as well. I think when you're inpatient and you're about to shock somebody though, you really are not going to go wrong with at least 50 uh, micrograms of fentanyl and then probably a little bit of Atomidate. Uh, really not going to have much chance of uh, significant side effects, but you're definitely going to make the process a lot better for patients. So that's definitely a good default to go to right there. Now let's move on to lines and procedures. So say you're doing a central line in somebody, they're moving their neck around a lot and it's becoming very difficult to do. What are some things that are going to be really good to give here? So in this situation, we're not going to give them Atomidate. This much more involved uh, and we don't need to achieve that level of sedation but could be what could be really good is giving Versed one milligram and then also again fentanyl 50 micrograms and again this is really going to cause very minimal changes in their hemodynamic status very unlikely to cause significant respiratory depression but really going to get them in a nice sleepy state holding still and comfortable for you to get that uh, central line in safely so this is something I'm definitely going to reach for in the future when I'm doing a central line and the patient's moving around a little bit too much and lastly just briefly I wanted to talk about intubation. Um, so for planned uh, intubations, what they tend to do is they really do uh, something like Versed, two milligrams, and then they do rocuronium, they do propofol, lidocaine, and fentanyl. So it's a quite involved procedure. When you're doing rapid sequence intubation, however, usually uh, the situation is a little bit more urgent and the patients are a little bit more unstable. You know, you're not sure that you're going to get their airway right away. So you want to cause less respiratory depression than you might cause with, uh, with this planned OR intubation kind of setup. And so with rapid sequence intubations, a lot of times they prefer Atomidate and then rocuronium versus uh, succinylcholine. And that's pretty much it. Um, you can give a little bit of lidocaine and fentanyl, uh, but they're probably going to avoid Versed in this situation because they want to avoid the respiratory depression. Uh, but really, you're going to try to stick with something that's more hemodynamically stable. And then you're going to try and do uh, something like succinylcholine uh, or rocuronium with Sugamidex as a uh, backup reversal if needed, just because it's a little bit faster on and faster off. And so if things need to be reversed, because you're not able to get the airway, it's a little bit safer that way. Anyways, I'm curious to see what you guys use for procedural sedation in your patients before common things like lines and shocking patients. It was something that I was definitely looking up last night because I, it was something that I felt like could have potentially come up. And I wanted to make sure that if I was going to order something for them, I knew exactly what would be the best things to order in order to make this procedure as safe and as comfortable as possible. So please let me know what you guys think. What are some preferred regimens that you guys like to use? Really curious to hear what your thoughts are on this. So please Please leave it down in the comments down below and we can all learn from each other. Really excited to hear back from you guys and hopefully this was useful for you guys as well, especially because as an internal medicine resident, I don't think we receive much uh, specific training on this until we ask some of our anesthesia colleagues or we look it up on our own or ask some of our ED colleagues who tend to use these medications a little bit more frequently. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.